Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, when I was growing up, the pastor would have said, y'all don't let that young person out praise y'all and out uh, give thanks. Amen? Amen. Youth, you can go to the back. Sister Destiny has a word for you in the back. Hallelujah. How many of you have your little oil with you? You have your little oil with you? Do you have a little oil? Hallelujah. Huh? Who don't have a little oil that I passed out this past weekend? Who wasn't here Sunday? Don't got a little oil. All right. Yeah. Charlie, do me a favor. Go look on my, my, my shelf. <laughs> look on my shelf that's in that white box and get, get enough to, but Brother Gabe ain't got no oil. Give Brother Gabe some oil. Though anybody, my sister right there didn't, make sure that y'all have some. Um, if you watch, then you'll understand uh, what a little bit of oil can do. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. This is the last, um, not my last service period, but this is, uh, this is the last service of this week that I'm preaching. Uh, I, think, I know he thinks he's slick. He's going to try to make me preach Sunday morning, but if he's watching right now, he better have a message ready. <clears throat> Amen? <laughs> we want to hear Brother Don give us a word. Uh, but this is the last message that I have on the anointing. Um, and it, since it is Wednesday night, I will, uh, it's in a white box, sis, on the very top shelf. It's on top of the books. There you go. It's a team effort. That's all right. It's a team effort. Sometimes aren't we glad to have people on our side? Amen. But uh, since it is Wednesday night and everyone seems to be a little bit more laid back than usual, then I'll teach more than I'll preach if that's okay. Every, every once in a while, it's okay to, for me to slow it down. I know sometimes I talk so fast that y'all don't hear me anyway. So I'll try to slow it down for you. Uh, I won't keep you long because the message is very clear and it's very evident. Uh, it's in the Word of God. But sometimes if we're not careful, we will uh, run over we'll run over scriptures in here and we'll, we'll love a doctrine without knowing it's backing. Does that make any sense? Does that, that sound, you know, anybody know why we do uh, prayer cloths? You know, it's in the Bible. The reason why we do prayer cloths is not because one day we just come up with this idea where we want to anoint some little cloth and hand it out. Uh, it's in the Bible. And because of that, everything we do should be rooted in the Bible. And because of that, a lot of us have misconceptions of what the anointing is. Um, we think that the anointing is just for preacher folks and, um, and people like that. And so uh, we, we think that somehow that we can't be anointed or maybe one day if we're lucky, we're going to get anointed. And I want to I want to maybe stretch your faith a little bit tonight that if you feel like you have nothing going on in your life right now, if you feel like you don't have not one drop of anointing, maybe you feel like at one time in your life you had a chance, you had a shot, you had something, but I, I want to I caution you to, to never count out what God does in the beginning because the Bible says that we were given the measure of faith. And I want to help somebody right now. If you have a measure of faith and you have enough faith to believe that God can put his hand upon your life and he can do it more and more abundantly. That's what the word says. And because of that, I, I want to, if you want to stand for the reading of the word, I'll, I'll get my scriptures out of the way before I talk about the more anointing. Uh, I have a little bit of a lengthy reading. I'm going to read most of this Acts chapter 6 um, because this is where God struck my heart about how to get more anointing. How many of us want more? And we always want more. Don't put that in your mouth. Hallelujah. Yeah, you can smell it, but don't put it in your mouth. Um, but if you want more of anything, you always want more of God. Amen? And because you want more of God, I want you just to pay attention as, as best as you can, and I'll do my best to give you what God has given me. Acts chapter 6 Starting at verse 1, it says, In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, so the church was growing, there arose a murmuring, not in the church house, yeah, even in the church house, of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, 
full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nic Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, the a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and the Cyrenians, and the Alexandrians, and them of Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom of the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned me, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witness, which said, This man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against his holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Luke chapter 6 verse 18 says, And they that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, talking about Jesus, for there went virtue out of him and healed them all. Acts chapter 5, verse 14. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women, insomuch as they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. Last set of scriptures, Psalm 92, verse 10 says, but my horn shalt thou exalt thy, like the horn of a unicorn. Y'all didn't know that was in the Bible. Unicorns in the Bible. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Heavenly Father, right now, Lord, I ask you to anoint my voice. Lord, anoint our ears to hear what thus saith the word of the Lord. We ask you to do these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand clap while you're sitting. I'm going to do my best to stay still behind this pulpit. Uh, and for the next few moments, I want to preach and teach to you about more anointing. More anointing. And, and hopefully you watched or if you were here this past weekend. If you weren't, I don't want to re-preach any of that. But I want to help you that the anointing of God is possible. Now, I've heard and uh, done some study, and some people believe that not everybody is anointed, and, and, and I want to I clarify. I believe that if you have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you, that you have anointing to be a witness. That's what the Word said, that once you receive it, you would receive power. And that's what anointing was. When David was anointed, they poured the oil on him and laid hands on him. He was anointed king. The Bible says, I read this past weekend, that the Holy Ghost came upon him. And we find that any time that there was anointing, the same thing happened with Saul, that, that he went and he prophesied and, and with some other prophets, and, and that even Jesus was greatly anointed and says the Holy Ghost came upon him and he went from there on. So there, there's two types of ways in the Bible that you can find uh, people who get anointed. Uh, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on these two things, but I want us to understand that there are two ways in the Bible this is what we follow, the Bible, that people were anointed. One was that God's divine encounter or relational came in contact with a man or a woman, and they were divinely anointed. Moses had an experience up on the mountain with the burning bush. He saw God pretty much face to face, and he had an encounter. Yet later on, whenever he would anoint other leaders, he laid his hands on them or he would anoint them to be leaders. And they 
also received an anointing that was like Moses, not as Moses, but it was like Moses, and they got that by the laying on of hands. In Timothy, it says, remember to stir up the gift that God's given you that, was, that you received by the laying on of hands. So there's two ways that people get anointed to do things for God, or that they are, that they have a divine encounter, relational with God. Now, you're not going to find a whole lot of people in the Bible. It is very few uh, con compared to the people who had their hands, their heads laid on, or they've been touched, or they were anointed by hands, uh, and, and, and or even oil like that. There are a few in the Bible who had the divine encounter. Uh, I'm pretty sure there are people out there today that think that they had a divine encounter. Uh, there are whole religions set up around something some guy had happen to him in the woods one time, and then all of a sudden now there's a big old religion based off of what happened to him, a divine encounter. But we have to go off of what the Bible says, and because of that, there's two ways that I want to help you on how not only you're going to get more anointing of what you already have, but that you can tap into. If you would like, I, and I don't hardly ever do this, uh, every once in a while when I feel it, um, I will lay hands on someone and that the words that come out of my mouth is that whatever anointing that may be upon me, I give to you. Um, I'm not one of those um, hocus pocus people that think that you can run around just uh, shooting Holy Ghost bullets out your finger guns uh, and shooting people down and shooting and killing demons from across the room like a sniper. Um, I'm, I don't believe in all that. Uh, I'm very I'm very to the point and matter of fact on the Bible. Uh, and I believe that at the name of Jesus, all that stuff is done and I don't have to walk around and and act crazy or act like I got you know like real Holy Ghost bullets coming out my finger. But I do know that in a moment that whatever anointing that has been on my life, uh, and even in, in that moment that there's a way to transfer uh, not my anointing, but that same type of anointing. And I want to cautious us when you're looking for more anointing, be aware of what comes with more anointing. It wasn't just by happenstance that that lady poured out that oil and filled up all. They had to go and borrow vessels and they had to have something to pour into. And because of that, I want to bring our attention to not, not just Stephen, but Philip, but, but all of those people. But Stephen is what I want to pay really close attention to. How in the world was Stephen elevated? And I know that the way this reads, it makes it read like Stephen was picked one day and then the next day he uh, seemed to get stoned. If you read your Bible any further, Stephen gets stoned by the multitude. Uh, but I read to you that whenever they looked upon him, that they looked on him and they saw the face of an angel. How many of y'all think, or your mama told you that you had the face of an angel whenever you was growing up? I mean, yeah, so some of y'all's mama lied to y'all, but that's okay. I hope she, she repented. My mama didn't lie to me. She always told me I was a, an ugly baby. But I just grew into it, so <clears throat> it'll be all right. But but what what we what we are looking at and what we need to, to pay attention to is, is that a lot of us think and, and, and I'm not negating that it's not possible to have more of God in, in an instant because we look at Paul. Paul's life is is very uh, much of the standard of what a lot of us we don't subscribe to in today's church. Paul's life was he was against the church. In other words, we could say that he, he wasn't an atheist, but in our vernacular, we could say that he wasn't a he didn't come to Christian life church. He didn't like it. He hated it. Uh, he may have been a guy that went to the food bank and then when he left, talked trash about everybody there. You know, he could have just been a guy who didn't like church at all. And then all of a sudden he had a divine encounter and anointing comes upon him later when Ananias lays his hands upon him. He receives the Holy Ghost. But he has a divine encounter, and that's possible, and it happened rather quickly. We read your scriptures, and it happened rather quickly, and all of a sudden, wasn't long after that, he had a divine encounter, and because of that, and then the laying on of hands, he leaves where he's at and starts to preach in the city that he's in. Is it possible for me to lay hands on you tonight and you to be evangelizing next week? It's very much possible, I believe, in the holy anointing of God. Is it probable this is how I want to help some of us tonight on how it, to make it probable, how to make it not more than possible. See, possibilities means that can God do it? That's yes. Probable means will he, will he do it? And I want to bring our attention to what Stephen was chosen to do. The, 
Grecians and the Hebrews were upset because their widows, and you have to go and read about what the program was. It, it wasn't Section 8, but it was when the widows were of a certain age, um, the church took care of them. When they were about 60 to 65 years old or, or older, uh, and they had no husband, and there actually was requirements. You had to go look it up. But they had to have been good to their children. They had to have been good to people. They had to been a servant. They had to have a good report. And because of that, that would, that would get you into the program that they were taking care of. And so this program obviously started or it, was, it had been around maybe part of the Jewish culture. Um, but then there was the Grecians or the Greeks. There was the ones who weren't Jews. And they were being served by mainly most of the apostles at the time. Those who were underneath the apostles were all Jews. And now the Gentiles are, 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 are and, the, and the, not the Gentiles themselves, but the Grecians are those who weren't from uh, their area possibly. They were treated less than. And because of that, their complaint was is that, hey, you know, um, the, the, our widows aren't being treated fairly. And so the apostles bring up a question. And I would bring up a question to you as well. If you're looking for more anointing, this is one of the questions that I would ask you. Does your anointing relieve the pastor from doing what you should be doing? That's okay. We ain't got to amen that. But it's a question you need to ask yourself. The first thing that they do is they decide that they have to find people who have not only full of the Holy Ghost, but they have to be of honest report, which means they ain't got no... They ain't got nobody running around saying that they got cheated by this person. Um, and they had that wisdom, and, and they wanted to appoint over this business. And this is where Stephen comes into play. The apostles picked Stephen, who was full of the Holy Ghost and had wisdom, and he was an honest report, and they chose him. They also chose Philip and these other men that I named. But they chose Stephen to wait tables. They chose Stephen to work the food bank. They chose Stephen out of this good report and whatever, to handle things that would relieve the apostles so that they could study the word and seek not only guidance and, and, and to study for their sermons and all that, but to further the church. That's what happened. And so when they pick Stephen, they pick these people. The first thing that Stephen didn't do is they start to serve the widows. And some of y'all looking at me like, oh, David's giving us a to-do list. I want more anointing. I, I'm going to get there. But they start to do the church work. How many of us ever worked in the church? You ever do anything around the church? You ever done anything for, you know, for the church? You ever ushered or you done food bank duties or you've maybe helped set up when we do uh, projects around here or we do different things. We've set up for weddings and funerals and we've done all these different things. And, and, and I want to help somebody right now. If you're looking for more anointing, you have to first look at serving tables before you ever look at serving any type of other way. Yeah. The problem with this world and some of the younger generation, and we got to help guide them and lead them, is, is that everyone's looking for a pulpit, but no one's looking to clean up the bathroom. Right. You ever been to a ball field? that has a, the stainless steel toilets in the bathroom. Uh, there's a few of them around. I've been to some nice ball fields here recently, but I've been to some ball fields like the, the, the toilets in jail look better than the toilets in the ball field, you know. It's the kind of place where you're not going to go. And because of that, it tears down the validity of what we can use the ball field for. You picking up what I'm putting down? A lot of times whenever we're seeking out for God to use us more, God is seeking to use us more where we are. And we don't realize it because what you're looking for is you're looking for a pastor to give a program or to, to ask you to tell your testimony. And I get asked sometimes, and not, not as much as probably I used to, but, David, do you think that I can tell my testimony? And I tell people, you should tell your testimony all the time. And what they really were asking wasn't whether or not their testimony was good or that God would use them to touch other people. What they really wanted was is they wanted this. They want, and, and then I understand that. I've been there. I know what it's like, I, I, you know, where you have a burning desire to help people, and you think that this is the path to that. And, 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 and I'm not downing this. This is part of it. But what I want to help somebody is, is that, that Stephen becomes somebody before he ever is seen by anybody. 
He, he isn't seen as an angel whenever he's waiting tables, whenever he's serving the widows, whenever he's helping them do whatever it is, hanging picture frames in their homes or whatever it was that he was asked to do. It was his job, along with the other men, to fit a specific need that was not glamorous. It, it's, not nobody, it's not one of the gifts. It's not one of the offices. It's not an apostle, prophet, teacher, or evangelist. It literally is just serving in the local church and making it better for the people who are leading and pastoring at the time. And sometimes if we're not careful, we will look at the anointing as this hocus pocus with the Holy Ghost finger guns. And we'll think that somehow when the anointing comes on us that we're going to be like Samson and we're going to rip lions in two. But I want to help you right now in this day and age in church. Uh, we meet more Stevens than we do Samuels and people who are willing to chop up people and to tear up lions. We don't find that a whole lot these days. Thank God there's no lions in Vinton, maybe just at the high school mascot. But there's no real lions in Vinton. And because of that, what we need more now in this day and age is people who are anointed to wait tables. And I want to help somebody because we find that Stephen wasn't ordinary. And, I, and this is where a lot of people feel like maybe you feel like you're just ordinary. Maybe you have the ordinary anointing. That's not a real anointing. But some people feel like sometimes that, that they're just ordinary. I just show up. I just run camera. I just do media. And if you're not careful, and I've been here. Listen to me. Before this church burned and I was, I was living with passion and before I got my own place, I was always up here. I cleaned. I did everything. I, whenever Jimmy J was alive, that man had me in this attic all over the place 150 degrees up there in the attic and and i did and i not toot my own horn i want to help you though you you look at me behind the pulpit today i want to help you how i got here wasn't going to seminary school or i wasn't kissing up to the pastor or my daddy or mama ain't somebody in the church or any of those those things that we like to throw people under us i literally just put my hands wherever god allowed me to put my hands and because of that i've seen different miracles not only in my own life but I've seen them in other people's lives and most of it was because I was there and when you start to serve in an aspect of tables and an aspect of where a need is that how many of y'all know how to sing anybody here knows how to sing well you know like you was a singer like some of y'all should have got recorded back in the day and cut an album you know most of us not not so much right most of us aren't singers right and so that it wouldn't do us any good for me to come up to you and be like, Sister Charlie, you know, I need you to sing a special on Sunday at the Unity service. If you don't mind, just whatever it is, get your track together from your last CD, you know, whatever. Get it together and just be ready on Sunday. That, that does, that, you know what that does? That does Charlie no good and that does me no good because what's going to happen is she ain't going to show up more likely to the Unity service. And what it is, I put unrealistic expectations on Charlie. And because of that, now most people, just being honest with about what people are, what happens is after that is once I put unrealistic expectations on you, then you have one or two options. You can either feel like, well, I guess I really don't have anything because the pastor wants this and I can't give it. And we start to judge ourselves, and then we judge ourselves harshly. And then so then whatever anointing we do have, we throw it out the window and just say, well, we must just be an old sinner anyway. We need to go sin. And if we're not careful, we'll pass up the opportunity and the blessing that's about to come our way whenever we don't put unwanted expectations on ourselves and we put expectations where they belong. And that's on God's word to where he said that he would always do it. He would not ever lie. And because of that, this man goes and he starts to wait tables. And in after that, then it says that he all of a sudden he performed miracles and great wonders among the people. He was full of faith and power and did great wonders and miracles miracles among the people where did he do great miracles and wonders at among the people where were the people what people the widows the people that he was serving I, and I know this may uh, some of y'all might have thought we was going to be throwing the I like the finger guns uh, I came up with that earlier I'm probably gonna use that a lot more uh, we thought maybe that I was gonna throw oil on you or I was gonna come up with some crazy idea but I want to help somebody and this is this is going to help you and and and, and I, I always pray that it does but some of us get so wrapped up into the great wonders and miracles and wanting to do all those things. And I'm right there with you. I want to lay hands on anybody who's sick and watch them recover because the Bible said I could and I want it. 
I want, I want to be involved whatever God wants me to be involved in. And that's in his word. So if it's in his word, it's in his will. And so I don't have to pray, Lord, is it your will for someone to be healed? So when I pray, I just expect it every time. And one day I'm going to lay hands on somebody and it's going to be visible. Right now I'm just believing in faith that it's happening on the inside, you know, because people don't wear diabetes on the outside that's in their blood, you know. So I pray against that and I believe it's going to happen. But before I ever get to the point where I'll see miracles and before I ever got to the point where I thought that miracles would happen, when I prayed, I had to have a relationship with God that made me a prayer, made me a prayer warrior, maybe somebody. And what happens is, is you don't find that behind the pulpit. You find that in your prayer closet or you find that in a moment where you're serving people. A lot of us want more anointing, but we have less love. We have less love. We have less people touching us. We have less. Um, we're less available. But yes, some listen to me. I'm not. I won't ever call out anybody. I, I don't. I don't believe in that over the pulpit. But anybody who is on a social media site or that you may even know that travels around and calls himself any one of the the teachers, pastors, evangelists, prophets, and apostles, anything they call themselves, whatever. If they do all of that and they're not touchable, then they're not of God. I'm just gonna let it sink in just for a second. I, I, I'm not big on these armor bearers and all that stuff, and that's cool. I wish I wish I had. I make my kids, when I go out of town to preach, I tell them they're my armor bearer. They're like, I'm just carrying your tablet, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, I mean, it, they don't understand whatever, you know, and I don't put a whole lot on them. But, but if you got a team of people around you and I can't shake your hand, that's not of God. I'm going to tell you right now, I read to you in the scripture that whenever it says that uh, in Luke that they were vexed with unclean spirits and they were all healed and the whole multitude sought to touch him. For there went virtue out of him and healed them all. Some of us, we want more anointing, but we want less contact. And I'm telling you right now, you're not going to get more anointing and less contact. you got to actually have, and this is the hard part that of my message, I'm not going to lie. Uh, most of us will clean a toilet, but we don't want to have to have people touch our lives. It's just the truth that we we want to we want to be private. How many of y'all like your private life? You don't want people to know what goes on in your house, right? Because sometimes when stuff that goes on in your house ain't for everybody to know, right? You know what happens though when you let people in? There's the possibility of being hurt. But I want to help somebody right now. You don't get you don't get olive oil without crushing olives. And nobody gets a testimony without a test. And I'm going to tell you right now, nobody has ever moved in and out of a crowd and had performed miracles without being in relationship with those people. And relational is what's going to get you. They touched Jesus because virtue went out of him. I'm going to help you. How does more come out of you? How do you get more anointing flowing in your life? People have to have a draw on you. And this is where most people want to go back to cleaning toilets and I'll serve tables and I'll set them up and I'll do whatever. Let me work behind the scenes and all that. And I want to help you. We need every bit of that. We need people making bags at the food bank. We need people serving in the back, cooking. And when we do, and that's all part of us serving the community and reaching people for Jesus. But I'm going to help you right now. If, if you can't be touched by a need and have it drawn out of you, then wanting more anointing is not going to be what you get. What you'll get is, is someone will have to fill your head with that, that you're better than. Yeah. If you're not careful, you'll seek out more anointing, but when you don't have people touching you and drawing the virtue of God out of you, what happens is, is then you just walk around all high and mighty. we we'll get you one of them prayer shawls, and you can just walk around and hold it and get you about four or five people and call them your armor bearer. And, man, whenever people try to come and touch you, you just have them box them out, you know, like you're the president of the United States or something like that. And then you just go around telling people that you're holy. And then whenever you speak that people are just supposed to listen. I'm going to help you right now. Nobody wants to hear me preach if whenever I get done preaching, I put the microphone down and I walk to my car, get in it, and go home. Nobody wants that. Nobody, if you don't have the virtue, if you don't have virtues at all, if you don't have love or anything like that for people, asking for more anointing is a waste of time. What you need more of is the Holy Ghost. Once you get more of the Holy Ghost, you'll have more of those fruits. And once you become meek and long-suffering and all those things, God can then use you like he used Stephen who was wise and, and had the Holy Ghost and he had power, but he went and served tables. When we look at his pedigree in the scriptures, 
Well, they talked about they talked about them other guys, but they said it about Stephen first and what Stephen did. And this is a passage that they're highlighting Stephen. But Stephen had all these things that were already in him, but yet they weren't maximized until he started to work at tables, until he was open to be used everywhere. I want to help you right now. If you have any type of anointing at all in your life or you feel like that there is some type of anointing in you or that you only have that little bit of oil that I gave you, that if you want more of it, you got to pour out what you have. You have to be easily touched by the afflictions of other people. Some of us, we miss out on the anointing of helping people because people are horrible. They are. And most of them are in our families, right? You know, those are the ones that are most horrible to us. They, you know, and, and, and when you're growing up, and if you ever grew up in a certain place like my dad used to come on, God rest his soul, he can't, he can't beat me up now because he's going on to heaven. But um, whenever he would come home from work, I worked with him. And on the job site, I've seen him bite his tongue, but then come home and, and what he bit off, he spit on us. And I try not to ever be like that. That taught me not to be that type of person where you take the job out on your family at home. But how many of us grew up in places like that where other people took out their issues on us because we were family? And that's how, but that's not how the family of God's supposed to work. And that's not how you're going to get more anointing. You can't, you can't sit back and bite your tongue in some places and spew up on other people and expect God to use you more. What's going to happen is you got to be like Jesus. And everywhere you go, you have to be available. That's what made Jesus, one of the great things about Jesus was is that he was available. How many of y'all know that scripture where it says that, that kids and everything ran up to Jesus and sat on his lap and that Jesus, and that he said, suffer the little kids to come unto me. You know who little children, they don't go around grumpy people. Children are a thermometer. Children will let you know who they trust and who they don't trust. Little kids are real slick about looking and saying, you know what? Nuh-uh. I'm telling you right now. You pay attention the next time. This is how lots of people have been, things have come to light. Because all of a sudden you'll be at a family get-together and little children will start to gravitate away from certain people. Watch that person. They got something with them. And that's how we, and so at the same time, it goes for all of us as well. If people who are children of the faith or who are immature in the faith or people who don't really quite know Jesus like we know Jesus, they ought to be able to gravitate to us. They ought to be able to come to us and say, you know, uh, you know can, can, I, can I ask you some questions about, listen to me, one of the greatest testimonies you'll ever be able to get is if someone comes to you and asks you a hard question about their own life that's in the Bible. That's just like if somebody, God forbid, I hope they're not doing it, but if somebody is engaging in fornication, or, or adultery or, or maybe they have something in the Bible they don't quite understand and they're doing that one thing. If they ever feel comfortable enough to come to you and ask you what the Bible really says, this is what I'm doing. I'm sleeping with this person's husband. Do you think people nowadays would know better than that? But let's just not count everybody out. Sometimes people didn't hear that growing up that that's a sin. You know, but, but if they actually come to you and open themselves up and say, hey, I need help understanding how can I get over this? That is a great testimony to the Jesus Christ on the inside of you because what that is is immature that's a and when I say immature I don't mean like like ignorant or whatever or not, not not like a kid but like someone who doesn't know who feels Jesus that's when the more anointing is going to kick in it's not whenever we we find a class for you to teach and and you start laying hands on everybody and that's part of it but but one of the greatest anointings that the church body our church body needs today is that need we need to every one of us have an open door policy on our spirit where people who don't even know us well enough can come up and say you know what so Stephanie I need to talk to you about this can you explain to me what God's trying to do in my life or what he's trying to tell me because I got these issues going on when someone opens up their issues and they bear them they show themselves to you that is part of the more anointing that you should have and we only get there when our hearts and our minds are like Jesus and like Stephen where we start to look at every place to serve as not a place where we end up, but a place where we are bouncing off of. Some of us are get our feelings hurt whenever we always have to work 
in the kitchen side or we always have to do certain things or I'm always stuck doing this and they never ask me to give a word or never ask me to testify. I'm going to help you right now. If you ever said those words out loud, that's the reason why you never got to give a word or to ever testify. Because when your heart is not on tables and on serving God, if you're not like Stephen and full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, then how can God use you? Because if all you care about is your voice being heard, then it's not your anointing. It's your voice that you won't magnify. And I want to help you get to the point where you can have more. This is where we all want to be. We all want to be, and I read to you, that the multitudes grew in the church, both men and women, to the point where they set Peter out. Uh, and, and when they did, he, when he walked by, people were healed by his shadow. How many of us want that shadow healing anointing, all right? Let's, let's just get some things straight about Peter. Peter had a rough road to get there. He knew who Christ was. He said, thou art the Christ. He was one of those, but he's also the guy that denied him three times. He's also the guy that, that took matters into his own hand with a sword, and instead of letting Jesus be glorified like he was supposed to. We all want that Peter anointing, but we don't want... How many of y'all know that Peter later, he argues with God? This is the same guy that has the, um, the shadow healing miracle, but whenever Cornelius is, is ready to receive, when we're our people, the Gentiles, are ready to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and to actually get into the family of God, that he argues with God and tells God that he can't eat the things in the vision that he's trying to get. And God says, don't call unclean what I've cleaned. And this is the same person that had all the struggles in the world, yet he has this anointing on him that his shadow heals people. And we all want that anointing, but a lot of us, we won't get to the point where we get talked bad about. Stephen was ridiculed as soon as people heard and saw that he was making a difference in the community. Not behind the pulpit. Not, not doing crusades, but he was making a difference in the community. Once he started touching a few folks, people started talking bad about him. I read you the whole scripture. You ought to go back and read it yourself. But it says that they were, they, they were talking slanders. They actually made up lies. It was the only thing they could do. because they. How many of y'all ever been told a lie on, right? How many of somebody ever been told the truth on you? <laughs> it, even when you're mad, when somebody tells the truth on you, you're not quite as mad. Is when they tell a lie on you. But when they tell that lie on you, you ready to just lay your Holy Ghost down and go to work on somebody, right? When they tell the truth on you, you, you get mad that they said it, but deep down you're like, yeah, that was me. I did that, you know. But there's a difference when they tell a lie on you. But this is what I want, I want to bring to your attention. I'm going to try to wrap it up here shortly. But getting more anointing is resisting the people who are willing to lie on you and the enemy's attack to the point that you don't slander yourself or hurt your witness. He still served tables even in the midst of great, great miracles being done by his hands, by his faith, by his anointing that he had in his life. He still served tables, and even when they talked down on him and tried to tear him down, the Bible says that they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. And this is where a lot of us fall out. How many of us are speaking with wisdom and by the spirit? You want more anointing, you got to make sure you crucify that flesh and get that mouth under control. Now, I know some people think that only the Holy Ghost can do it. I want to help you. The Holy Ghost will help you. That's what the Bible said. It's a helper. But you can't run around saying negative words. And I'm not just talking about curse words. I'm talking about negativity words. You can't be quick to run your mouth on something that you don't like. People pick up on it even your kids and your family members, to the point is, is that those people will be the first ones to shoot you down when you think you're being elevated because they know that you're quick to run that mouth. I want to help somebody. You want more anointing. One of the few things that you really need to do is, is be slow to speak. Slow to speak. Now, for most of us, this is the hard part. This is real hard because I'm quick. I got that quick wit. I can, I can pop it back to you real quick. It comes to my brain. It comes right out my mouth. I 100% understand I'm not better than nobody. But I can tell you right now, if I don't watch what I say, then people will be able to resist my words. And the words that they say will have validity in my life. 
Know what that really means is that every negative thing that the enemy tried to throw at you, when you open your mouth, you either do one or two things. You either bind it up or you loose it in your life. And when you bind up the enemy's attack by not speaking negativity, it says that they won't be able to resist you because you'll speak by wisdom and by the spirit. How many of us need God to help us with our mouth? Amen. Amen. Most of us do. If we were going to be if you didn't raise your hand, at least maybe you did one of those. And 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 that was good. And so I want to help you. The last scripture that I read to you in the Bible is from Psalms. And this is David. And he said that my horn shall be, a, thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. And I shall be anointed with fresh oil. The freshness of your anointing is how you get more, is what I want to bring to our attention right before I'm about to uh, close. Is that, and anyone who wants anointing i will i will anoint you with oil and i will pray over you and release you to do whatever god has for you in your life but all anointing comes from god yeah. amen i just want to make sure that what brother dave does for you tonight won't mean the hill of beans if jesus don't back it up right all you did was got some oil on your head and all i did was waste my breath all anointing has to come from God and out of the Word of God. If it don't line up with the Word of God, then you don't want more of that. You want less of that. Right. So another, another principle on how to get more anointing, the Bible says that I must decrease so he can increase. And the more I decrease is how I'm going to get more of him. And the more of him that I have, then the more anointing. And then I'll be like Stephen that even whenever they try to really get me in the end, they'll look upon my face and see God. Just like Moses, when he was close in relationship with God, that's how he got that, that glow where they had to put the veil on him. And the anointing that was on his life was relational. It wasn't, it wasn't just someone laid hands on you one time and you got anointed. It's relational. It's fresh anointed oil. It's not stagnant. You can't get anointed. Look, listen to me. I want to be very clear. If you were anointed back in 1987, all right, and somebody said back in 19, I don't know how many of y'all was alive in 87. If back in 1987, you was alive back in 19, some of y'all was real young in 87. Uh, but, and someone laid hands on you and said that one day you're going to be something for Jesus. All right? That oil then is not what you need right now. It ain't doing you no good. You know why? Because you was anointed in 87 and you ain't done nothing with it since then. And because of that, what we need is, is we need fresh anointing day in and day out. If you feel like that you've had some type of anointing or you felt like you've had, if, if you got the Holy Ghost, let me help you. If you got the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God living on the inside of you, you feel like you're saved, you feel like that God, you and God have had a relationship, but you feel like maybe the rest of your aspect of your Christian walk isn't quite working like you want it to. Some of y'all are in the middle of waiting tables right now, and you just need a better attitude. You just need to be touchable. You, you need to have your mouth to be able to speak to people and that they can't resist the words. That's how you know when you have that more anointing is when you speak, it's less of a struggle. Because when you speak, people will listen. Even if, they, even if you're telling them no, they'll take a no from you because of the anointing. When no, most of the time they want to fight you and run your name in the ground, if you're anointed, they won't, they won't run your name in the ground. They'll take the no you give them, and they'll move on. And this is how you're going to realize that is whenever you are already in the middle of waiting tables, check your mouth and check your attitude and make sure that you're decreasing so that he can increase. The miracles are coming because they come because Jesus wills it. It's whether or not you're going to be the vessel he uses to do it. And the only way to get the more anointing in that greater vessel is you got to empty out the junk that we bring with us and the preconceived ideas. And we have to base our anointing out of the word of God. And when we're touchable by people, when we're available to people, where people can actually come and ask us for prayer and they know we're not going to go run and tell everybody. Whenever people can actually come to us and they realize that we actually believe that Jesus Christ can do something. Whenever we love people, even whenever they've done us wrong, that's when your anointing comes. It's the crushing of the olive that gets the oil. But the only time that the oil is ever poured out is by the person 
who is in charge of the pouring out, which means that it, your anointing is in your hands. God wants to give you more. He wants to use each and every one of you under the sound of my voice for more. He wants to use you in great things, miracles, signs, and wonders, all those things. But before he ever does any of those things, we got to be willing to wait tables and watch God show up in the community where we are. And then one day, you'll promise you, you'll get up behind a pulpit and you'll be like, Lord, I don't know how in the world you got me here. And then you'll maybe think back to Brother Dave telling you, it was when you started waiting tables and you were touchable. And the minute you became touchable, you became somebody who could love people because whenever you're like Jesus and they touch you, the virtue of God will run out. Not your virtue, not your issues, not your opinions, not everything that you think you are, but God's anointing on the inside of you and what you're going to see. As I helped somebody a while back with their family. Your family will want to come to church with you whenever they see the church with you when they see you. When they see God working on you but in the position that you're in right now, if you feel like, because most people don't like to wait tables, you feel like waiting tables is beneath you, then, then, then you've missed it. But if you feel like, God, I need more of you tonight, let's stand on our feet. Say, God, I need more of you. I, I need more of this anointing. I need more of something. People want to speak in tongues. They want to prophesy. They want to do all the gifts and all that, and that's good. You're supposed to seek those things. But I'm going to tell you something. When it comes down to all those things is whether or not you're touchable, whether or not the anointing can be magnified in you, whether or not you can receive more. Check your vessel. Is your vessel full of everything you think you are or what you think you're not? Is everything that you think about yourself so negative? I want to help you right now. God doesn't want to fill a negative vessel. He wants to change the negativity into positivity. And then when he does that, your vessel will be full and you'll be able to do things with God that you never thought you'd ever be able to do. Because he'll open doors, the Bible said, that no man can shut. There are things in God's plan for your life that require the more anointing. What we need to do is, is just get over ourselves and say, God, Lord, let me decrease so you can increase. And then before long, and it don't make no sense to tell you this, but you can go from serving gumbo at Happy Birthday Jesus on Christmas to preaching a Christmas service at some other church or any other church somewhere else and watching people come to God and give their heart to God in that one night and actually go from feeling like, man, all I was doing was serving gumbo and now here I am being used. And you say, Brother Dave, that's not how it works. You got to go to Bible school. You got to do it. I'm telling you right now, that's how it worked for me. How I got to where I am right now was not but because I was some super smart person who knew the Bible backwards and frontwards. I just served everywhere that I could. And I never thought that I'd ever do this at all. Never thought that I'd be a pastor. I never thought I'd do any of those things. And because of that, when you start to serve, you get rid of you and all the junk that's in you, and you receive more. If you would right now, just go ahead and lift our hands. I'm going to pray over each and every one of you. They're going to turn the music on. The altar is going to be open. If you want me to anoint you, I sure enough will. If you're looking for more anointing, but I'm asking you right now with your hands lifted up, Lord, Lord, right now you see each and every one of our hearts, Lord. Lord, show us the tables that you have for us right now, Lord. Lord, fill us up with the Holy Ghost. Lord, fill us up with purpose. Lord, make sure that we understand what we're doing. Lord, guard our hearts and our mouths, Lord Jesus. Lord, help us to decrease so you can increase. Lord, we know that there is a table out there that is a platform that's going to propel our ministry to more anointing, Lord. We're going to walk in greater anointing, but we understand, Lord, there's a table right now that needs to be served. There's people that need to be able to touch us, Lord. There's people that need to be able to reach out to us. I'm asking you right now, Lord, let that anointing right now of servanthood, Lord, let the anointing of tables fall in this place right now, Lord, on each and every soul under the sound of my voice, Lord, that we can do exactly what your will is Lord and turn this world upside down for you in the mighty name of Jesus they're starting the music right now these altars are open if you want me to anoint your head with oil please come down I will. if you gotta go God bless you I love to be back here on Sunday 11 o'clock